Foster is going to run it out past the 40 in the Giants territory. He is going to go all the way. Touchdown, Chicago. Trying to find somebody open. And throws an interception. And it's Charles Woodson's 55th of his career. Dies for the touchdown, San Francisco. I want to play desperately, and I'm going to try to drive everyone nuts until they give me a shot. Carved through an almost impossible 336 career interceptions. See that? Yeah. We have here the uh, Brett Favre interceptions calendar. It's the lovable kicking bear doll. And guess what? It comes with its own goalpost. Isn't that neat? Babble doink. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Cut the Cheese, Poke the Bear, Roast the Niner. We've got Gold Rush, Lord Uther, and myself, Urza Master, and we are at NFL kickoff week for the 2024 season. Uh, gentlemen, welcome back. We uh, probably have all been through our fantasy football drafts at this point. Uh, I tell you what, this year was my first year drafting first overall in many years and i cracked under the pressure i cracked i chose Brees hall over christian mccaffrey and i'm probably going to regret that later on in the season you will um but my wife had the number two pick and she got christian mccaffrey so <laughs> i think i think it'll be okay um but i had a good draft um hopefully you guys did too in your fantasy leagues because all nfl fans should play fantasy football um but today, got a lot to talk about. We're looking at a long season ahead. Some great, great matchups opening up this week, even marquee across the board, including my beloved Packers are playing for the first time for the NFL in Brazil, uh, in uh, Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo. Um, so that's that's pretty Sounds exciting. Good, uh, interesting, they picked the Packers and the Eagles to play in a stadium which does not allow the teams to wear green. Hmm. <laughs> and both of their away jerseys are white. Hmm. hmm. <laughs> um, now, the Packers could wear their throwback jerseys, the Titan jerseys, blue and gold. Uh, and I suppose the Eagles could show up... Uh, I don't know, skins versus jerseys, I guess. But um, <laughs> it'll be an interesting opener. Uh, Thursday Night Football kicks us off, and we've got Packers on Friday of all days. Football throughout the weekend. Gentlemen, what are you looking forward to most in this opening week? Go ahead. I'm, I'm waiting on you there, Gold Rush. Uh, well, I mean, the, the Niners will get the... Uh, climactic showdown on Monday Night Football, a, uh, September 9th, against, uh, they'll be hosting the New York Jets and a rejuvenated Aaron Rodgers. Uh, so we'll see how that goes there. Obviously looking forward to that game. Uh, my, my looking at week one, there were some games, I mean, there were some teams that can't afford to lose early. Uh, but, I mean, someone's going to go 0-1. Uh, who's got the schedule up there? I think Detroit has a tough one early, like either Detroit. I'm not sure who, who they're hosting. They, I believe they're at home. Who's got week one's Detroit? I, I got it. Uh, Tam oh, it's uh, Los Angeles at Detroit. So, yeah, Rams at Detroit. No, no. Yeah. yeah, Rams yeah. at Detroit for week one. Not only should that be a high-powered affair... But like I said, the Rams don't want to start 0-1 in the, in the you know, conference you know, slash division, and the Lions want to prove that they belong. So obviously you never want to overreact. You can take a week one loss and still triumph. But that's a pretty big game as far as it goes. Unfortunately, there's a bunch of games that, that don't really have that impact. You know, Dallas-Cleveland, I believe, is a week one game. Pittsburgh-Atlanta is a game like that's being played Carolina Saints is a game yeah, so Vikings Giants yeah Vikings at New York Giants so, so I mean unfortunately yes you love football but there's a few matchups where you're just kind of like I mean obviously Chiefs Ravens Green Bay Philly sounds great uh who do your Bears have 
Uh, the, the Tennessee Titans. The Tennessee Titans. See, it would have been much cooler if it had been the Texans. So, I mean, there's there's just some sort of, I wouldn't say average, but there's just some games where you're kind of like Pittsburgh, Atlanta. I don't know. Flip a coin kind of a thing. But, but speak, speaking of averages, I, I'm in this Pick'em League with some people I've known for a very long time. Shout out to the commish. But... So every once in a while, I will reference the odds, like the the odds, like what's the line on the games that might help me pick, right? Usually, if it's in within three, I'm gonna take the home team because I'm a big believer in home field advantage. So many of the games this week are two and a half to three and a half. The only game I think that is ten or maybe it's seven and a half was the Dallas game. That I think that was the only one. The rest of them are super close. Uh, on on the on the line there, it's it's kind of crazy. Some junky match matchups, but just a weird close week that's going to be played out. Let me ask you guys this: Do you like a league or a team that it's going to have parity, where you get a bunch of nine and sevens, or do you like a team that jumps out to a fourteen and three, like who's going to stop this juggernaut, et cetera, et cetera? Like just as a football fan. I mean, obviously, if it's your team, 14-3 and three sounds pretty good. But are you a fan of, like, whole conferences or divisions where, you know, you got three or four teams in the division and they're all, like, three and four, you know, after the first six weeks or seven weeks? Like, how do you guys feel, like, about just the idea of parity versus any team could beat anybody and it's a coin flip versus, yeah, we've got some really good ones and then there's some real stinkers at the bottom of the barrel? Nine and seven, or something like that. that. Sounds like crappy football to me. I mean, or or a crappy like when I'm, if we have a bunch of them at that point, it's to me then the teams are just middle of the road. I I am that person that likes the team that's you know I got fourteen and three or fifteen and two or whatever they're playing. Next thing you know, they'll be 20, playing twenty nine games at some point. I'm sure, but I th- aren't they going up to eighteen this year? Is it eighteen games this year, or is that? The following 18, year. 18 yeah. weeks. 18 weeks. 18 weeks. Oh, okay, with the bye. All right. But, I mean, I like that one team that you wonder if they can make that push the entire way. Um, with that being said, I'm always a believer that you got to have a loss. I've, I've always believed that as a coach, as a fan, because it, 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 it puts you in check and it makes you humble just a little bit. That year that the Patriots were undefeated, I knew they were going to lose the Super Bowl. I knew it. Because you got to lose along the way, even to figure out maybe there's a weakness that, that even the slightest thing that just needs to be adjusted just a tinge, and then you rip the rest of the way. 85 Bears would have loved them to have been undefeated, but I, they needed that loss for them, for them to be like, oh, wait a second, we, you know, we can lose, which takes me to this... Rocky analogy, right? When when Rocky, you know, cuts Drago, look, he can be cut, right? You you got to have that, otherwise you are you're gonna lose. And, and and of course, the big game like the Patriots that year. I just talked a lot, Urza. Yeah, no, I I I I, I tend to agree. I, I like the idea of a team getting that gut check, and I've seen my beloved Packers have that happen a few times. Um, and it always happens after the bye week, and I feel like they don't learn anything because they're like, oh, it's after the bye week. You know, or, or it's a trap game. You know, like, yeah, no, you need a punch in the dick from time to time. I'm sorry, but you do. Um, I love parody in the league. I love watching my team win more. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, I, I like it when there's, you know, like one or two powerhouses in each conference, um, but there's still those scrappy teams that could upend them in the playoffs. Um, so I like seeing a, a, a good average, like, you know, I guess in historically be 10 and six, but like 10 and seven teams, um, I think are, are, are fun to watch or, or nine and eight, you know, getting in on those wild card spots and, and making a splash. I, I really enjoy watching those teams play football, um, because they are, they have to be scrappy. And a lot of the times it's not really that they're playing bad ball. It's that they've had injuries. Um, you know, the Packers, I watched the Seahawks do it one year. I think they got in at like seven and nine, yeah. um, but they were a good team and it was just injuries just killed them. 
Um, and it was still exciting to see. Um, I mean, I remember, uh, you know, the year that, uh, The Packers ended up losing to uh, the Jets the first week in the playoffs. You know, we were, you know, clawing at the bottom of the barrel trying to make it in on a wild card. And, yeah, I mean, the Jets were just, you know, under Chad Pennington, a good team. And we gave them that gut check they needed, and then they got knocked out the next week. <laughs> um, but it was – it's exciting. Like, I, I feel like, you know – Tom Brady is definitely probably at least in the, in the argument for the greatest of all time, if not the greatest of all time for a lot of reasons, but I don't necessarily believe it's the wins that got him there. And I know that might be kind of weird to say, but I, I, I feel like he was the player that played humble. You know, he, he wasn't making these giant contracts, you know, he's 10, 12, 14 million a year kind of guy who, took pay cuts so that he, they could beef up the rest of the roster. And that's why they were always like 12 and 12 and four or 11 and five. And, you know, they, they took some rough losses. You know, I think one year they lost to like the four and 12 dolphins. Um, but at the same time, it's like, they had to have that, you know, you had to have that test of faith, uh, not only in your team, but in your fan base. Because I feel like your fan base, if they turn on you over one loss, you're probably not going to win a Super Bowl. Um, and that's where I think, like, Chiefs fans, Niners fans, Packer fans, you know, they've really stood tall over the years. I think Patriots fans, quite frankly, got to the point that they won so much, they really roasted Tom Brady if he had a bad game. Um you know, and now granted, they still had plenty of other amazing players on their rosters. Uh, but yeah, I, I like seeing I like seeing a powerhouse. Um, you know, and if it's not my team, I prefer it to be an AFC team. Um, but the nice thing is, is like if everybody was kind of in that nine and seven, nine and eight range, you are going to see like probably the hardest fought football games you're going to see. Um, and it's usually kind of, I always like to call them, you know, bottom barrel games, but those are the teams that really, they, they play like they have nothing to win or lose. Um, kind of like playing a, a sub 500 team late in December. They don't care if they win or lose at this point, they're playing for pride. They know they're not making the playoffs. No matter what happens, they're going to go out there and try to steal somebody else's chances. Uh, and I've seen that happen to the Bears and the Lions and the Vikings uh, so many times, and it's delicious every time. But I've also seen it happen to the Packers, and it hurts like hell. So I, I don't know. I, I, I think it's the spirit of football. Like, of course, I love watch. I Like, the year we went 15-1 and one was awesome. Um, but to be honest, like, there are some of those games where we won because – the other team committed a bad penalty late in the game. And it's like, you know, I re actually there were years, full years with Aaron Rodgers and, and Martellus McKenzie, as I like to call him, the beaver at coach who couldn't call a game to save his life, um, you know, where they won because the refs called the right penalties at the right time <laughs> over and over and over. And then they got in the playoffs and everybody was shocked when they got knocked out of the playoffs early. And I'm like, well, of course they did. They barely won half of their games this season. And I felt like I was the only person paying attention. I'm going to go on record right here and now and say that I was calling for Mike McCarthy's job about two years after the first, after the Super Bowl win, because I knew right then and there, the guy gave up in the fourth quarter and third quarter. And eventually he just gave up the whole game. I was at his last game it was like he wasn't even in the building, and I was looking at him at the 50-yard line. I'm like, bro, get the hell out of here. There were signs saying, fire McCarthy in the, in, the seat, in the stands at Lambeau. The fans at Lambeau are notorious for loving their team and their coaching staff to a fault. And we suffered Mike McCarthy way too long. Nothing personal against the Beav. He's a great coach. I'm sure he'll be in the Hall of Fame someday. He's doing fine in Dallas, but... My goodness, was I happy to see him go. Okay, I went on forever there. 
Um, I'm, I'm excited for football, you guys. No, no, you can tell. All right, so this should be fun this week. I thought we would go into some of our rivalry games because we have three strong, proud NFC franchises. And I thought we'd match up since we're talking about fantasy football and all of that. I thought we'd do a little head-to-head matchups here uh, between the little you know triangle of teams here that, that we root for and, and scream for and cry for. Uh, red and gold and, and green and yellow and, and whatever the colors the Bears are, blue and orange. Um, so let's start with the, the Niners Packers. Uh, so it'll be me versus Ursa Master here. And what we'll do is we'll pick a game, a famous game, a not so famous game, an infamous game between those two storied franchises. And really quick, why that game may have stood out for whatever reasons. And my 49ers Packers, my most vivid game that, that still haunts me to this day, was an uh, NFC uh, championship game in January 11th, 1998. Uh, it was actually the playoffs for the 1997 season. It was on uh, uh, 1 o'clock at Fox. It was at the Niners home stadium, which I believe was still being called 3Com Park back then. No longer Candlestick. Uh, There was a little bit of rain. The temperature was 57 degrees. Pat Summerall and John Madden were calling the game for Fox. The Niners had had a first round bye. Under new coach Steve Mariucci, they'd gone 13 and three in his first season after coming over from Cal Bears. Uh, I mean, everything was in place and the Packers had drummed the 49ers out of the playoffs the previous two seasons coming off the Super Bowl win in 94 when they met in the 1995 season Brett Favre led them to a 27 to 17 upset at the stick uh, they also the Niners had a first round bye that season they were 10 point favorites in that game Steve Young uh, coming off the Super Bowl campaign in that playoff game uh, this this was the divisional game he had no t- no touchdowns and threw for two picks uh, it was 21 to three at the half. Packers just stunned the Niners faithful. You had Mark Chamora and Keith Jackson, uh, you know, running and catching with from Brett Favre. Craig Newsom had a fumble return for a touchdown. So it was a rude awakening and a quick early exit the year after a Super Bowl win with Deion Sanders and Jerry Rice and Steve Young. Then the next year, the Niners for the '96 season. They went 12 and four that year, and they beat the Eagles. Uh, I think in the wild card round, they played the Pack at Lambeau, very wet, very rainy, treacherous conditions. Desmond Howard had two kick returns in that game, one for a touchdown. They were down 21-0 right out of the gate again. Uh, Andre Risen and Edgar Bennett uh, were big. Steve Young had an injured rib. He was two of five for eight yards total in this game they turned to Elvis Gerbach to finish it off and he couldn't um and the Niners went 12 and 4 think about that for a second now they went 12 and 4 in the regular season they fired George Seifert for going 12 and 4 and losing to the Packers for the second straight season in the postseason now you think 12 and 4 this year in the NFL gets you like uh, a 38 million dollar extension and you know the keys to the city but the Niners fans were spoiled. I was spoiled. And they thought 12 and 4. I remember the owner, Eddie DiBartolo, saying, that's just not the 49ers standard. So, you know, pride cometh before the fall. And, and we were due for a fall, which is why this game on January 11th for the 97 playoffs, uh, that's why it had such a sting. Because here it was, the team you were facing off, you had a 13 and 3 regular season, you had a first round bye. You had just thrashed the Minnesota Vikings 38 to 22 the week before in the division round. Uh, Yes, Jerry Rice had torn up his knee in the first game of the season against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Warren Sapp with a vicious uh, tackle took Jerry Rice out, but they had continued on like the Niners had persevered under first year coach Mariucci and everything said, everything said that this was the year the Niners break through They defeat Green Bay, they move on, and they reclaim their path at the top of the NFC and eventually the Super Bowl. 
and the Niners lost 23 to 10. Uh, they were held to 257 total yards. They had four fumbles. They were sacked five times. Garrison Hurst was a 1,000 yard rusher for that season. He had 12 yards on eight carries, and the team in total had 33 rushing yards. It was the last game for Brent Jones, their all world tight end. Uh, and just why that game sticks with me, that horrible loss. A, it was the third Sears in a row the Packers had ended our postseason hopes. But everyone said, oh, they'll get their revenge. They're at home. All of these things in the headline bulletin board material. And it didn't matter. The Packers simply played better. When the pressure was on, when the postseason lights were on this team, you don't give up four fumbles and five sacks and rush the ball for only 33 yards and expect to win any football game, let alone one with as high stakes as this. And so as a football fan, as a 49ers fan, it was a sobering moment for me to realize it doesn't matter. Like, it just matters who's healthy and who's playing, you know, at the top of their game and executing on that particular day. Everything else was just prologue. And so it, it really kind of colored me for the next 20, 25 years of, of watching football, knowing don't believe the, the headlines and the breathless buildups and the sports columnists who on Friday picked the Niners and said, this is their year. They've got, you know, everything a dynamic coach, a, a, an offense that's clicking, a defense. Look what they did to the Vikings just the week before, 38 to 22. No. So I will always remember uh, the third Packers 49ers. Now, as a nice postscript, the fourth time they met in the postseason a year later, that was the uh, catch two game with Terrell Owens, Steve Young in the waning seconds of that contest. So they did finally break through. It took four seasons to do it. But it was that third season where it just seemed everything was on the table, all the cards were there, and we still came up dry. So that's my 49ers Packers meaningful game. Well, if by some miracle we would have chosen very similar games, I had to go with the 1,000th game uh, that the Green Bay Packers played. And it just so happened to fall on January 4th, 1997, Steve Young, Elvis Gerback, ah. where we beat San Francisco 35 to 14. Um, I, of course, was a kid at the time. So I grew up under the waning, waning days of the uh, 49ers franchise. But I remember those early Favre games and uh, games even under Don Mikowski where I mean, the Niners were just, they were the NFC team. It was them and Dallas, and, you know, you just couldn't stand either of them uh, if you were any other NFC team fan. And uh, going back-to-back -back years in the playoffs and beating the Niners and then doing it a third time, um, oh, it was just sweet, just sweet, which made the catch-2 game all that much more bitter. Um, looking back, um, I mean, it, I don't remember that game very well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and actually, ironically, in my collection of Brett Favre victories, I don't have uh, that third meeting uh, at the, at the, in the championship game. Um, it may be due to the fact that we ended up losing that Super Bowl, <laughs> uh, which was an absolute devastation. Um, but, you know, like you said, it's all who's playing on the top of their game that day. Um, but I figured I'd, I'd since that game got brought up, I might jump ahead a little bit and just, just take a look at maybe another Niners game in ye old collection here. Uh, and let's just, let's just find a sampling from a couple years down the road. Uh, because I of course grew up bra uh, the biggest Brett Favre fan. Um, and I happen to remember a certain wild card game with one of my favorite quarterbacks. And I feel bad because it was a journeyman uh, not Vinny Testaverde, who's my favorite journeyman quarterback, but Jeff Garcia started for San Francisco yes. in 2002 yes. in the wild card game. And that was a big game because, you know, historic rivals, San Francisco, Green Bay in the playoffs, a lot of uh, talk that week. And I was just old enough to kind of remember, like, the hype between the entire school being Packer fans, pretty much, 
you had a handful of Bear fans, a handful of Vikings fans, and there's the token 49ers fan who was just like all up in arms, like, no, we, we're, we're going to do this. This is, this is our year again. And Jeff Garcia is a, a great quarterback. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I'm not, I, I will argue that to the end of time. Him and Vinny, uh, two of my favorite journeyman quarterbacks, but to see Brett Favre beat San Francisco is just something special. Just mm, the cream rises to the top. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that 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 is, uh, I mean, there's so many great NFC rivals, I mean, of that era, the the late 80s through the, you know, mid-2000s. And, you know, I look at, I look at four or five teams in particular, and San Francisco is probably three, number three. Um, because it was just such an intense battle between two teams that had amazing quarterbacks. I mean, you know, Favre was young at the time, but like Steve Young was an amazing quarterback um, who deserves all the accolades, of course, that he gets. But to see, you know, Brett Favre and Steve Young play against each other, oh, man. Lest we forget, Elvis Gerback, also journeyman quarterback, um, played for DeBears. A couple ah, of times as well. There you go. Over the years. So uh I think it'd be fun to talk about the uh the Bears Packers rivalry, yes. if I may kick that off. Go for it. Well I want and you I guys can... to both go at me and I'm gonna i I'm gonna finish up because I have an important point to bring up that's connected to your two teams. So Urza, you go and then uh Gold Rush there. Okay. Uh I mean, shall I count the ways that we have beaten the tar out of Chicago over the years? Uh, I can certainly count all the quarterbacks. Um, you know, there's a couple of games in 2001 I'm looking at right now. Uh, oh, here's a good one uh, with quarterback Shane Matthews, the Shaneinator. If you remember him, you don't. Nobody does. There's a reason for that. Um, let's just pull another one out of here. Oh, uh, Steve Stenstrom. Hey, you know, back in uh, 98 as well. But I'm going to go back. I'm going to roll this all the way back to December 1st. 1996. Um, Dave Craig. Dave Craig. Oh, uh, I was right? Yep. Look at that. Look Dave Craig. Uh, we beat Chicago uh, in, in Lambeau uh, 28-17. And this, of course, was, you know, the year, you know, 96-97. And I remember almost every game that year. Um, I, because... Obviously, I was eight, nine years old, nine years old at the time. Um, growing up in Wisconsin, you know, and remembering the pre-Brett Favre days, the, the Magic Man days, very, very vaguely. I was very young at the time. Um, I remember the game where Magic went down and Favre stepped in. It burned into my mind. But there was no... And I lived in West Central Wisconsin, so we weren't quite a border town with either state, so we kind of had a mix. Uh, but my family kind of fell on that line of we hated the Bears. You know, we were the Green Bay fans. The Bears were our rival because the Vikings were an expansion team, but they're also a big rival, and then Detroit <laughs> was Detroit. Um, and I, I, I remember in 96 especially because that year, for whatever reason, it just felt right. Felt like all the ducks were in the row, that we were going to go all the way. Favre had promised us the Super Bowl. The Lombardi was going to come home. And, man, you know, it was just something something special about being December in Green Bay. It was cold. It was, you know, these two, like, battle-hardened teams, right? But these were not the Bears that, you know, my uncle at the time was such a huge fan of, you know, he was still in 96 talking about 1985's bears. Now I thought, okay, all right. You know, after 96, after the Packers finally win their next Super Bowl, you know, they're going to stop talking about 85. What, what, what year is it? Lord Uther 2024. <laughs> and, and what, what, what team did the bears keep bringing up? I was talking to my students about it the other day. Like I saw, <laughs> I saw the Bears playing a Super Bowl, and they're like, what? <laughs> you saw that? I go, I was your age when I saw it. They go, wait. And they start doing the math, and they figure out how old I am. But I go, yeah, 1985. I go, those guys 
have been living off of 1985 since 1985. <laughs> they are they are still kings in Chicago. They went back in what 002 with uh, the Legend Killer, right? Yeah, Rex Howard? Grossman, my friend. Oh, Rex Yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I remember that. Okay. I watched that one. How many wasted? But I'm 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 berating. I'm I'm getting ahead of myself. Go ahead there, Gold Rush, because it's all part of the plan. You want here. me to do Niners Bears then? Okay. Uh, my Niners Bears memory. Uh, I had a few to pick from, but we'll go with December fourteenth, nineteen eighty-seven, in the run-up to the Christmas season, and I was a freshman in high school, fourteen years old. Uh, that was a ten and two Niners team meeting a ten and two Bears team. On Monday Night Football, primetime ABC, uh, you had Bill Walsh coaching with against Mike Ditka. Uh, you had stars and all-stars and all-pros uh, on both sides of the field. And there was a lot of chirping from Bears and Mike Ditka about how tough the Bears were and how they were going to show those West Coast uh, weaklings the how they went there. The game was at Candlestick Park. Uh, Walter Payton for the game ran, uh, had seven carries for 18 yards. Uh, he had two catches for 16 yards and one fumble. Uh, Steve Young threw for four touchdowns and had eight carries for 43 yards. Uh, Jerry Rice had eight catches for 75 yards and three touchdowns. And Dwight Clark uh, had two catches for 42 yards and a touchdown. It was 20 to nothing Niners at the half. It was 34 to nothing for the Niners after three. The game ended up being 41 to nothing San Francisco 49ers in an embarrassment on Monday Night Football. And Coach Ditka was so upset, he threw gum into the stands at Candlestick, walking into the locker room, and was later approached by the San Francisco police because the woman wanted to press assault charges because he hit her in the head with some gum. Cooler heads eventually prevailed or the lawyers stepped in and Ditka avoided incarceration in a San Francisco jail that night. Uh, but the humiliation... 41 donut, huh? Yeah, the, the humiliation was there. Now, the following season, 88, the Bears beat the 49ers, I believe, again on a Monday night, 10-9, to in not much of an offensive game there. The Niners would have their revenge in the NFC title game in sub-zero Soldier Field. Once again, hearing about how Midwest beats West, that was 28 to three uh, on the way to the Niners Super Bowl victory over the Bengals. And then just random games between 89 and the turn of the millennium, Christmas Eve 89, 26 nothing San Francisco. December 23rd, 1991, 52 to 14 San Francisco. January 7th in the playoffs, again, meeting in the playoffs, 44 to 15 San Francisco and then on December 17th 2000 a lot of December games and January games here uh, a really bad San Francisco team they went 6 and 10 in 2000 uh, they weren't any good trust me but they still managed to beat Chicago 17 to nothing and they hold a 3 and 0 all-time playoff victory head to head against the Bears they've never lost to Chicago in the postseason but I think it was the Ditka gum, because I was a freshman in high school. I took a lot of heat for being a San Francisco fan, as you can imagine, in uh, Reagan's America and Mike Ditka's town. The Bears were, again, just two seasons removed from that Super Bowl. They were 10-2. and two. They were a good football team. I am not downplaying how strong they had been in that season. They were a violent, physical football team. They loved to pound you. Walter Payton would run over you. Jim McMahon would dice you up in the secondary. And San Francisco handled them like it was the JV team. And I just, that always stuck with me. I got to pump my, print my chest for a week around school. Uh, and then I was bullied and, and it all went back to norms. But, uh, but yes, a good early Christmas present, the Ditka gum game. I always try to refer to that one as at the stick. Well... I'm, this is all going to come together now in a really bad cholesterol congealed nice. mess. So here we go. Bears versus Packers, 2018. 
Mitch Trubisky looking like possibly the future of the Bears. They're up 20 to 0, third quarter, 3 minutes and 30 seconds, 337 left. Immediately the Packers start going on a roll. Rodgers eventually gets them to 23-17 with 239 left in the fourth. Then Cobb catches a 75-yard TD pass from an injured Rodgers with a left leg that is hurt, I believe, at that point. And uh, with 225 left, uh, oh, that's where, that's where the pass comes in. And then um, they wind up winning that game and defeating the Bears after the Bears were up 20 nothing with 337 left in the third. Which takes me to, and there's a reason why I'm, I'm going somewhere with this, the N Niners game is the 88 NFC Championship game. So it's funny that kind of aligns with you again. Bears lose 28-3. to It's the last game for Jim McMahon, a quarterback. Now, here's where I'm going with this. Since Jim McMahon, all the way up until now, we have had 36 quarterbacks. 36. The Niners in that same time frame have had 10. A couple scabs here and there, but Garcia, Young, Montana. Kaepernick. The Packers have had three. Well, if you count the Magic Man, four. It, and so when, when it comes to, so that means the Packers have had 32 less leaders, and, and this, this is where I'm going with that. The Niners have, tw have had 26 less leaders in a sense where the idea of leadership that's supposed to come from the quarterback position and the stability that should be there that grows over years and years and years is what is going to lead a team to success. The Bears have wasted many, many Super Bowl-type defenses in that time frame where if they had a consistent quarterback... They could have done something. I, the other day I was watching on YouTube Jay Cutler throwing to Brandon Marshall, and they were looking like they were when they were back in Denver together. And they couldn't, and, and, but Cutler's, in my opinion, an awful leader, which does not help that team. Now, Caleb Williams, and, and yes, I'm, I'm going to go there. He's named the first rookie captain. I, it might be in the history of the Bears. I'll, I'll have to double-check that. But, I, but he was named a rookie captain. They are pinning every single thing they have on this USC grad. And the reason why I'm keeping my fingers crossed is like we talked about last week, I do think he just has the instincts to be a quarterback. Now, just let, I'm going to make this next statement. Just let me finish because I can hear it already. Like, uh, he's not Patrick Mahomes, period. Next sentence. He has instincts for the for the game of football just like Mahomes has instincts for the game of football. Hey, that's fair. I'm not saying that they're the same. I'm not saying that he's as good as Mahomes. But I think there there's something to be said for the touch of a pass, recognizing a situation that that you haven't had to drill over and over and over again and you still can't get it right because you're just not a good quarterback or you just don't have that natural playability about you. And I, and I do think he has some of that. And I'm someone, and, and Urza knows, I wasn't that high on them go, drafting him, mostly due to him saying he wanted a piece of the team before he even got drafted. That really, really bothered me. With all that being said, since then, I feel like he has won my respect or earned my respect just by doing a few things, very simple things. Pick up your water bottles, right? The connection he has with his wide receivers, literally and figuratively. Like, I think that's very important. And and so I think someone even said off record, the, like, the, the receiving core couldn't stand fields last year, and that caused a lot of problems. It's the complete opposite with Caleb Williams. All those things have to be there in order to have success. So... Could this be our string of 12 years of having a, a quarterback that could actually help take the Bears on a decent path of success? I hope so, because numbers don't, I mean, the numbers don't lie looking at your franchises over the year. And, and my students sometimes, because they're like, what, you know, what do you think of the Packers? And I said, I respect them. 
because of how they run their organization, which is why I think the Bears, the McCaskies need to sell. I think the day that they sell the Bears is the day that we get monumentally better. So my only fear with Caleb Williams having success is the McCaskies are never going to sell. Like, if Williams rips it off for 12 years and the value of the Bears goes from $4.5 billion to $15 billion, they're, 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 not, they're not getting rid of them. They're just not going to do it. So that's, that's my whole reason why I picked those games. Just the leadership at the quarterback position means all the difference in the world, even though we're known as a running team, right? That's a fantastic point. By the way, uh, I just got a page from Octoon Baby era Bono, and he would like you to return his sunglasses uh, after this broadcast, uh, if you can. So. He ain't getting them back, because I love these. Okay. Bears. Zoo, 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 okay, zoo. so, I'm, by the way, I'm taking the Bears this weekend against the Titans, and I'm, I'm going to go, oh, I don't even know if we're at that point yet. Did I just take over the show? Yes, you did. I'm yes. sorry. I must, you did very roll well. with it. Roll with I it. I must not have been following my outline that I have right here of, of what we're doing for the show, so I, I apologize for that. Um, I'm going to take the Bears 24, Tennessee 17. Caleb Williams gets his win at Soldiers Fields, and the Bears are declaring this a Super Bowl season. I'm not. One more thing, like I told you guys in the chat. Eber Flus loses his job at the end of this year if they don't make the playoffs. I really think that's going to be the case. All right. I think, I think you're right. Urza, tell me about that. those Packers. Ooh, a swerve, a swerve. I'll take Gold Rush's Thunder. Um, I think it's going to be an interesting game in Sao Paulo. Um, I am taking the Packers over the Eagles. I know the Eagles are a very, very tough team. Uh, I think on that kind of a road, you kind of have to throw away home field advantage completely. Um, so it really feels like a weird kind of scrimmage game. Uh, it's the first game of the season. I think the Eagles don't have it all together. It's not dialed in yet for them. I think this is the loss that's going to get them on track and they're going to have a good year. Uh, but I think the Packers are going to win it. I think it's going to be uh, a bit high scoring. I'm going to go with 38 to 27 Packers. Uh, I think we're going to see some rookie mistakes on defense on both sides. Uh, and I think that the Eagles offense is going to struggle uh, as the Packers defense coalesces late in the game, probably mid third quarter maybe even fourth quarter. All right, gentlemen, Gold Rush will finish this up. I think this is going to be a yawner on Monday Night Football. I think both offenses will do a lot of three and outs, to be honest. You're going to see a lot of great punt coverage. Uh, I'm taking the Niners at home, but I don't think that I would definitely bet the under uh, if, if you're into that kind of thing. I, I think this game, Jake Moody kicks two or three field goals easily. Maybe you get a rushing touchdown from McCaffrey, maybe a little pop pass from Purdy on a slant in there. Uh, I'd say the ceiling on this game is 17-13, uh, but I think you guys at the third quarter will probably be saying, hey, I should get to bed. I got to get to work tomorrow. It's not going to be anything to write home with. I'm looking for a workmanlike game, uh, kind of sloppy, uh, and and just sort of, like I say, a lot of uh, missed third down, third and five, a pass that just sails and or incomplete, and then bring out your punt team again. So that's my call, 17-13. Hey, real quick there, Gold Rush. Brock Purdy, is he your quarterback the next five years? Is he your quarterback the next ten? Five and ten. I think... Well, I mean, health-wise, I, I, have, I have any doubt on longevity, especially in the quarterback position for the 49ers for 10 years. But I, I was a believer of Brock Purdy. It, it took me about three games to get over the Mr. Irrelevant tag because I think, like you said, it doesn't hurt to have a well-coached offensive system in Kyle Shanahan. And it doesn't hurt to be throwing to Brandon Ayuk, Christian McCaffrey, Debo Samuel, George Kittle. I mean, that doesn't hurt. But if you took Brock Purdy right now and put him on the Titans, I don't think we're talking about Brock Purdy at all. I think that he's he has maximized where he is. 
I think I don't consider him a system quarterback or just a game manager or so forth. I think Brock Purdy makes plays. And I think if you don't think that, you're not watching film. I think Brock Purdy makes plays. I think there's still a lot of room for growth and a lot of maturity, kind of like a Peyton Manning coming into the league where you could see what was there. And I'm not saying Brock Purdy will surpass Peyton Manning, blah, blah, blah. But Peyton Manning got better every year. And Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers got better. They just got smarter. They got more experienced. And I think that's the upside there with Purdy. But he doesn't have to apologize to anybody. And he doesn't have to explain himself to anybody. Yeah, he can have a terrible game. Witness the Baltimore game on Christmas Day where he threw like four picks. Like, he's capable of having a terrible game like any quarterback is. But I feel like Brock Purdy is a player. And I think... If you're down, if he's down seven or ten in the fourth quarter, he's not going to go in the huddle and feel like the moment's too big. I feel like he can get that ball down the field uh, in a hurry and and put you in a position to go for it. Now, if he's down 26 to nothing, maybe he starts, you know, taking some plays off or whatever. That's another story. Again, most quarterbacks would. But I think, I think Brock Purdy right now, is he the best quarterback in the league? No. Is he Patrick Mahomes? Clearly, they've had you know a head-to-head matchup. No, he wasn't. But is he? Should he be in the top ten or fifteen NFL quarterbacks out of thirty-two teams or thirty teams? Yes, he absolutely should. Oh. Okay, my I'm going off script again. I apologize. There's a um, last question for their Gold Rush. When his contract is up, is this someone who's getting Jordan Love money, or is this someone who's getting? 12 mil a year like what what's 10 mil like what 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 do you think i hope character wise i hope that his deal is structured so on on paper you know kind of kind of like what they were doing with garoppolo before him where on paper you could say oh wow look at that but in i think the reality of the situation i hope brock purdy does what ursa was saying tom brady does which is i'll take 15, you know, 17 million a year, as long as some of that savings re-signs Trent Williams or gets another, you know, healthy linebacker, free agent, you know, or an edge pass rusher. And I honestly think Brock Purdy, the way he conducts himself, you may not have seen him in the post-game interviews or in the local media or the so forth. He comes across anyways as sort of the anti-Aaron Rodgers. He's very team first. He's very humble. He's very, you know, assuming Iowa farm boy, you know, kind of a, you know, he, he does the tractor pulls and so forth. He goes home and works on the farm in the, in the, you know, bye week. So I hope he's the kind of guy that says, you know what, we can make the team better. I don't need to get paid, you know, an exorbitant amount and have Scott Boris negotiate my contract and so on. So that's what I'm hoping to see. Yes, he deserves to get paid so far. And yes, he's going to be a great franchise player for the Niners, but I don't think he wants thirty-six million a year or whatever you know, whatever Dak Prescott's holding out for. Like, I I just don't think that's him. You know, I I think he's I think he's more humble than that. I can't wait to see what team pays Dak Prescott that crazy money, and then deep sixes that team for the next how many years, like. Like what happened with the trade um, with Minnesota. Herschel Walker? <laughs> yeah, in a it could, be, it could be Minnesota or Cleveland. It's uh, one of the two. It's always one of the two. Um, that's all I have to say about that. Yeah, um, unless for some reason, if if Deshaun Watson gets hurt before the trade deadline, you betcha, Cleveland's <laughs> going to take that bullet all day. Write it down. Um, yeah, you heard it here first, folks. I, I do like Brock Purdy quite a bit. I think he's going to be a long-term franchise player. I think, I hope he's, in that sense, the next Tom Brady, where he's like, I don't need all that crazy money. We can keep making the playoffs every year, possibly getting to some Super Bowls, winning a couple maybe. That that should be every quarterback's goal. Um, I was really hoping Jordan Love would be that same type of player, it's apparent that's not going to be the case. Um, so he better go out and earn right. his money. That's all I have to say. He's got four years. I'm not saying I don't like the kid. I think he's a good quarterback. I think he could be a great quarterback. This year will definitely be 
the proof in the pudding. He better go out and earn that big contract. But one of the reasons Favre is still my favorite player, uh, even after all the stuff outside of football that's gone down, uh, is because Aaron Rodgers was never team first. Favre has always been a better leader, um, always will be. Uh, Aaron may have better stats uh, career-wise. He doesn't have more wins, and he uh, has the same number of Super Bowls. Um, But quite frankly, now that he's done his outside of football thing too, he's he's slipping. Um, And I I, no no hate on Aaron Rodgers. I know he listens to the show. Uh, I'm all for him doing his thing, being himself, whatever. I hope he has a good season too. Uh, big fan, still. Um, just he'll never be better than Brett Favre, and that's something he's got to live with. Uh, just, Jordan Love, maybe. Just so Gold Rush knows, Aaron Rodgers is the one who recommended these sunglasses. So oh, okay, there it is. Okay, got it. I, I think that's important that you know yeah, that. That it is very good. Well. The real question here is who's going to go on the next Aaron Rodgers ayahuasca trip? Why not? Why not cut the cheese, poke the bear, roast the niner? All three of us, Aaron Rodgers, a cave, Peru, ayahuasca. I don't even know if that's geographically the correct location. I'm just making things up. But uh, give us a call, Aaron Rodgers, 555-5555. But until next week, football fans, NFL fans, Green Bay fans, Chicago Bear fans, 49ers of San Francisco fans, we bid you good football.